brand. I think it's a brand. This is my brand. Amazing. <laughs> so I'm really, really excited to talk to you today. Uh, especially because I kind of want to talk about this from more of the like anti-capitalist angle that you've been taking with this season. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of how you take all of your seasons and everything you do. Uh, you're pretty outspoken about it. And that is so amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily put the B in subtle as far as my work goes and my own political leanings, but I, I mean, I, I feel yeah. you. I wearing literally uh, chose this shirt intentionally. How is it? Displacement is a disease. We we feel it. We feel it. We feel as it, a New actually. Yorker as well. Very intimate relationship. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that the 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 messaging in this season, especially as the season progresses. Um, that will become really, really clear. And what's sort of interesting about Mentopolis is like in different seasons, sometimes you're exploring a big macro issue. And then other times you're talking about like, you know, when we did season two of the Unsleeping City, spoilers for that, there were big macroeconomic issues that are being discussed there, but also issues of like the depersonalization and alienation that capitalism creates on an individual level as well. And for Mentopolis, what's really interesting is the societal issues of Mentopolis are themselves the deeply personal and individual issues of Elias Hodge, the scientist that is sort of the big guy whose mind Mentopolis is. Um, That's what I think is so brilliant about this season. A lot of people are mentioning the, the similarities to Inside Out and these like anthropomorphizations of all these individual parts. Mm -hmm. But I think even more is the like, the call out and homage to Metropolis, Fritz Lanz, uh, his whole film and his whole anti-capitalist dealings. Got the poster right up on the wall next to, of course, a sword. Oh, oh, but of course. Of How course could you not sword. have sci-fi fantasy right next to each other? Let's go, let's go. So, uh, yeah, so my question and our conversation today is kind of going to be around intent and, like, where the seed of the ideas for using this combination of Inside Out and Metropolis to convey this anti-capitalist, anti-pharmaceutical industry messaging, mm -hmm. which is deeply fascinating to me personally for so many reasons. I was a pharmaceutical investigator for a little bit as well. Wow. Looking into ADHD uh, inefficacy in their medications, deeply fascinating. We'll talk about that another time. But uh, I really want to ask about where this inspiration for combining these two ideas came from and what you're hoping, what you were hoping to do with it and how it actually played out. So I think that the, uh, there is a running theme both in political and economic ideologies and within personal psychology and my discipline. So I consulted with tons of psychologists and neurologists in developing the season. So my, and my personal discipline that I come from is philosophy, right? Which is, which has lots of places where it intersects, but also lots of places where I think, you know, very ancient philosophical questions have been really blown out and expanded by the development of psychology, neurology, under, you know, the entire field of epistemology has these like sort of, you know, um, answers from antiquity that have kind of gotten blown up by, well, actually, <laughs> we do kind of know why we think what we think and how thinking works a little bit more than we used to. It's, it's you a know, smidgen. A smidgen, a smidgen. <laughs> uh, so it's always really exciting as a philosophy geek to talk to psychologists, right? And I think a lot of the, like, the biggest moments of understanding philosophical precepts for me has come from talking to psychologists and neurologists, right? Um, what is interesting about both of those on the personal psychological level and the larger political economic level is the idea of unexamined systems, right? And what any psychologist, neurologist will tell you is the huge weight of mental activity, which does not happen under the auspice of conscious choice, right? Whatever you're, you, we don't have to get into a whole free will debate here, but the idea of like a lot is going on in any one's, one person's mind outside of 
the things they are consciously choosing to think on or focus on. So the idea that a lot of our prefrontal PIs this season are things like curiosity and attention, but that they are collaborating with things like impulse and pleasure, that you have these sort of different systems in the mind that are working side by side, that not everything is aligned on. And I think, you know, something that people brought up that I think does apply to capitalism, socialism, Marxism, uh, and applies to interpersonal psychology and our understanding of the self, people were like, how do people in the in Mentopolis not know what's going on with the big guy? And you go, actually, that inf the information of what your society is actually organized to be doing and what its central projects are is a thing that powerful classes like do a lot to keep out of the spotlight, right? So the idea of like of like does like does your balance center really know that you're walking to your job or does it just know that you're walking? And the idea of like you, some part of your mind might know that you're, so, and how that translates to capitalism and political struggle and class struggle. So I don't know if that's a cogent thought at all. Oh, but... absolutely. No, I so deeply understood every part of that. Great, great. I, uh, I, we, we strive for lucidity. Uh, <laughs> We do our best, and it's really hard nowadays. It's really hard. Don't I think that's tried. also something, the meta nature of this season, of like you're not just working on an anti-capitalist message within the city of Mentopolis itself, dealing with the different class structures within it, but also the fact that on a meta level, they're all part of this laborer who, as we discover in episode two, is working against this larger system in power. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And there's a very interesting thing there that I feel like is a big organizational question as well, which is the whole idea of trying to leave the hyper-American individualist sense of like, it all comes down to, you know, our individual actions. We don't need to think about organizing. We don't think it need about groups and communities. But counter to that, the idea that within our, like, what does it take to have that moment where an individual chooses to organize. What does it mean to buck a system? And that's a really challenging thing to do when, you know, it's it's not just like this neutral choice. You're making a choice to buck a system when gravity is already pushing you down that system's channels that it's pre-selected for you. So I think there's a lot of that idea of like seeing in these early episodes of Mentopolis, like, ooh, like if, for, if, for example, it was really important to me that one of the things, like like if you've seen the first two episodes, one of the things that it's not conscience that makes the decision to like grab the file, it's impulse. It's in, so the idea that like what has more power in Elias Hodge's mind, <laughs> conscience is a scared little kid, but this wealthy heiress who comes from an important family, she has the key that can turn the thing in. So if she listens to the kid, then that's what you, because I feel like there's this weird, um, I'm rambling. There's a weird puritanical. You're not, by the way, just to I, let you know, you're saying okay. something very profound. <laughs> I appreciate it. There's this weird puritanical idea that impulse has a negative connotation, that like virtue is always conscious and deliberate. And I think that that's wrong and messed up. I think we have <laughs> lots of beautiful moral impulses and that there are moments where, and I think in a lot of ways, actually, you see uh, impulse as an important part of the process to rem to remind you that things are wrong that you've accepted. Like, like there are things that you're going along and suddenly something goes like, wait, this room is filled with smoke. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like I I'm a frog in a slowly warming pot and some impulse in you goes, it's getting hotter. It's hot. It's too hot. Right. <laughs> And that's true, but I don't mean to just reference climate change, but also across many different types of systems that feel like are ramping up in terms of inequality and oppression, that occasionally it is good to have that moment where your conscience, your your moral self, and your sense of impulse goes, I've got to act. I've just got to do something. It's going to feel irrational. The system that has been designed to keep me compliant benefits from making moral actions feel irrational, but I have to do something. Right. That brings me to kind of a twofold question. 
first being uh, that I kind of want to work our way back to is what role do you think that like tabletop role playing games and actual plays like Dimension 20 play in community organizing and education around these topics? Mm -hmm. And firstly, the question I would like you to answer, mm -hmm. was that intentional in the character creation, the different ideas of these different impulses and how they have relationships to these classes and different power points? I would say that a lot of the, so a lot of this comes together really organically, right? We, uh, and I'll, I'll answer the TTRPG question first, and then I'll talk about like what Sounds prompted good. character creation. So I feel like TTRPGs, and of course within the industry of TTRPGs, there's a lot of thoughtfulness, like, I am here doing an interview about a show that is very much owned by a company. Let's all appreciate the <laughs> irony and, ap and appreciate the bargains we make with the system we were born into. That being said, um, I think that one of the beautiful things about TTRPGs and why I think we there's like a love of them in this moment is the idea of they are a game that prompts you into the building of community. It's not passively consumed. It's something that makes you find people you love or at least people that you care about and want to hear and tell a story with them. And you tell a story together. And again, like, obviously I have the the deep, calmed life, like the, the incredible opportunity to be able to play these games with people I love and care about for a living. But I also still play home games and play mini games for free. And those stories are just for us at the table. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. In terms of their value in organizing, I would say that, um, you know, in a weird way, the larger issue of capitalism wanting to alienate and isolate anything that creates community is sort of almost like a little bit revolutionary in and of itself. However, I would say on top of that, Rolling dice is not a substitute for organizing your workplace. It's not a substitute for, so I wanna be clear, I don't think tabletop games can save the world, but I think that they are a, a healthy part of a balanced breakfast. <laughs> you should use them as an entree into organizing your workplace, organizing uh, uh, whether whether for direct, you know, direct mutual aid or mutual aid, direct action, uh, 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 electoral uh, uh, victories where and when you can find them, especially on the local level. All of that is groovy. Use tabletops to make friends and then radicalize them. But, um, <laughs> but yes, snaps no, to that. Yeah, no substitute for the organizing. We have to, you've got to get out there and, and do. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things you got to be in the streets for right now. That's you got to be in the street it. for a lot of things, for sure. <laughs> labor, labor actions. Yeah, exactly. All yeah, the fact that you're doing the Metropolis themed show during hot labor summer, the first one to premiere during the like sag wga strike like, that's crazy what wild timing we just announced today i'm going to be running uh, a uh, a game on the curb at the universal lot august 30th I saw as, that. A, as incredible. a as a strike yeah solidarity wga sag iatsi all and again it's like not even in just my industry but the ups workers and the the, the flight attendants came out to march with us it's just like mm -hmm. across you know i hope anyone uh, uh, watching this interview or reading this article gets out there and, uh, uh, you know, like if you're, un if you're unaware whether or not your organization, your shop, your job is unionized, find out. And if it's not, there are resources available to you, uh, uh, National Labor Board and everything like that to organize your workplace. It's hot labor summer and I think it's going to be a hot labor fall. Absolutely. It is 100% going to keep going. And I do think uh, that Shows like yours definitely promote education about these topics and promote conversation in a way that's really accessible that I think is very important. I appreciate that. And that's that's sort of how we feel too, is that there's a, you know, I, like I'm aware of, you know, we create a show. The show uh, has a couple different jobs that it has to do, first and foremost of which is entertain people, which is also a beautiful thing, right? To be that, to, to be a source of comedy and levity and a moment where people can come and find these stories. But also while you are entertaining people, 
it is completely free to also make something that aligns with your values, right? You can, so it's like, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can make something that's really funny and entertaining and engaging that also is something that we're proud to stand by. And that's sort of our goal with every season of the show that we do. Yeah, and I think it absolutely reflects. Uh, so going back to the character creation aspect of it, I really wanted to know, when manifesting these characters uh, and deciding that like Alex was going to be conscience and that Hank was going to be the fix, how was it introducing these new players and characters into this system with this kind of idea of like, all right, I'm going to tell this this story with this sort of leaning and kind of need to have people play these roles. You're saying it was organic, but like what level of intention went behind it? Um, I think there's, I think that there's like a level of like, the values of the show are really clear. The values of dropout are really clear. Um, and I think that there's a degree with, with that cast, you know, you can see the degree of agreement on the issues that are at play, both with sort of the themes of Mentopolis, what it's drawing from, like, you know, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, but also noir. Like, if you look at the history of what was going on in the country when noir was happening, like, my God, all the stuff with, you know, uh, uh, communists being blacklisted and Elia Kazan and on the waterfront and ratting out, you know, like, like uh, associates in Hollywood, the amount of brilliant uh, uh, communist, socialist, progressive uh, uh, writers and thinkers that were drummed out of the industry during the McCarthy era. It's like noir is, has this rich vein within it. And also in terms of like, there, there are certain elements that you look back and you, you kind of see or look at and you go like, oh, here's a genre that even when it's not talking about these issues, is talking about working class people, which like living in 2023 is not even a guarantee. You look at like a lot of our popular media and you just go like, as a proportion of population, the amount of stories we tell about rich people is outrageous. And listen, I love a lot of them. I'm not, I don't want to <laughs> wag a finger at any, uh, anybody, but it's, it's just like, oh, look at the 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 cultural obsession with wealth even in terms of the stories that we choose to tell so when i say it happened organically i mean you go to noir as a genre and you go with people that already have shared values around uh class oppression inequality capitalism and you suddenly have that you know everyone on that team is pro union everyone on the cast and crew were a union shop through and through so you say here are these noir tropes that already are hearkening back to the era that created them in which the struggles are sadly but also in inevitably the struggles that we have today mm -hmm. and you come back to uh taking our modern values applying them to these tropes and then putting it in this kind of uh, you know, as cognitive functions. That's sort of what I mean by organically is like, I don't like everyone was psyched to tell this story, but I also don't know how you would have avoided it given the source <laughs> material, you know? Absolutely. No, 100%. And I think also the comparisons to right now to uh, Weimar Germany, where Metropolis is originally from, like there's just a lot of uncanny, unsettling parallels happening. For sure. Um, one thing that I really wanted to touch on as well that you we touched on a little bit earlier in the interview uh, about the way that these almost like uh, have you ever heard of IFS internal family systems form of therapy? I actually have not heard of IFS. It's really fascinating. I think really applies well to Inside Out and this show. Uh, and it's very much the idea where we each have different parts within ourselves that are in communication uh, mm -hmm. and each have their own feelings and thoughts about the various things that are going on, which I think very much speaks to what's going on right now. I'm definitely interested for you to again, go on your own and explore that because I think it'll be yeah. fascinating. But the ways that this larger capitalist system, the big guy is interacting with, is dealing with on these personal levels with each of these characters. Um, did you have like a, you already have all of these puns set up, but did you have an idea of like, I want someone to play the conscience, I want someone to play the the hyperfixation, like where where did that level of internal uh, punishment that capitalism enforces upon us, I suppose, where did that? Well, it's really interesting, right? Now, there, there, are, there are some interesting parts of this. There was an early, so one of the things that we sort of did, and this was in doing a lot of, 
uh, not only scientific consulting, but also sensitivity consulting with neurologists and psychologists came from, was early world building things just so that we could get the lines really delineated. And one of the early things was sort of like anatomical, biological, chemical realities. We wanted to be more represented by objects and locations. And then the, the, the characterizations were more classical, philosophical, psychological constructs. So like attention and curiosity, which are really like, if you had to put the idea of curiosity on the STEM side or the humanities side, you'd probably do more towards the humanities. Mm -hmm. And so it was intentional that's like, the more we get into things like oxytocin, oxytocin you know, like the hippocampus, those become like places, architecture, objects, right? Mm -hmm. So oxytocin is like a narcotic that's been prohibited in the kind of prohibition era thing. Oh, the heartbreak that happened when oh. it's like, oh yeah, he doesn't get to have pleasure because he hasn't had a human touch and his bosses haven't told him that he's worthy yet. I was like, yeah. oh God. Oh God, oh no. But so the um, what happened was people were pitching a bunch of different character ideas. And this is actually true of every Dimension 20 season. Normally I ask the uh, cast to pitch two to three character concepts that they're excited about or that they, that they find something interesting in. And then what we do, because there's a weird thing that can happen, like on, a, on an obvious level, it's like if everyone comes in ice cold with their number one character concept, Maybe you get six hunch curious, just <laughs> totally by accident, right? So there's an element of, I call it like designing the constellation. If everybody has two or three ideas that they're excited about, we can start to play almost a puzzle creating game of like, oh, your, your second idea and your third idea are kind of similar. So we probably shouldn't have both. Who's more excited about one? Okay, you're a little bit more excited about your other idea and you do want to, so you, okay, you don't play that one and you do, and it's about designing the, the group. So if everyone has a couple ideas, you're able to design the group a little bit more smoothly. And that's also true for um, the noir side and the cognitive function side in Mentopolis. So on the noir side, it's like, oh man, we don't have a gangster. Like I remember that there, you know, I think there were a couple different ideas from Hank as well. And it was like, no one else had landed on someone that was like a classic gangster. And Hank was excited about both ideas. And it's like, you gotta be the heavy because we because mm -hmm. you can't do a noir story. Same with, I think like, Oh, and the same thing always happened. Nobody had picked a detective, and, and in a noir story <laughs> that, because it's 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 the last cookie on the plate syndrome. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to take detective. Everyone wants to be genteel and <laughs> and very you know. So, but Trap had this idea for this like bruiser constantly getting his ass kicked guy who would be curiosity, and I was like. Curiosity is such a shoe in for detective. And it was like, oh, that's right. And then Trap was like, but I don't want to be the detective. I don't want to be like the main character in the noir thing. And I was like, you don't worry. It will be an on. So it's, a, it's because people are very um, selfless that they mm -hmm. sometimes avoid those archetypes. But I was like, but we got to have, you got to have the PI in a noir. Um, you gotta have the tropes. Otherwise, the tropes. Well, otherwise, what are you doing? Where can people understand what's going on? Exactly. And then I think for, I think Alex was really excited about being the news, wanted to put like a little newsy kid as a fun archetype from the genre. Um, and, uh, and then conscience was one of those things. And that was a very interesting one because conscience is a huge part of my background in philosophy, but we, it was an interesting thing to, when I was talking to neurologists and psychologists about the season, there was this, you know, I think that they have a really clear professional boundary where talking about right and wrong, good and bad are things that for a lot of really smart professional reasons, they try to avoid doing. So that was a moment where in talking with Alex about that, it was like, okay, if we're playing conscience, what's the way to not have that be a metaphysical thing mm -hmm. but to actually be a representation of how people understand conscience how we understand the the voice in our own minds that goes like 
I think this is wrong. Or like, oh, what? A, try to hold the door open for that. Like that kind of pro social communal, like I want to take care of the people around me impulse. And that's the thing too, is like conscience again, is very much an impulse. It's, a, it's another drive within us that is represented and has a voice. And so this little dog nosed, sweet little newsy, slightly translucent newsy is just, I love Conrad so much. Oh, and as the, as the philosophy very inner child also. So there's a very interesting thing there where we, and I think there was an interesting element of the inner child sort of dialogue. And that was one thing that we actually got advised on by our uh, neurologist, psychologist consultants was they were like, as much as possible, because inner child, like there's a, there's a deep understanding of that sort of archetype. But I think there was a moment in one of those consultations where we got the advice from someone of like, try to label things as their functions as much as possible, which is the same reason that you see an inside out that it's like these are the primary emotions because it's it that communicated from us to the audience and also to ourselves that like we should understand that mentopolis having these different cognitive functions is the normal working of a mind. Like the things that are a problem in mentopolis have to do with the reality of Elias Hodge and what's going on with him at work and these other sort of like capitalistic factors, but that like the people that we're representing as our characters are the normal cognitive functions of the brain. It's just so brilliant. I'm literally, I'm literally just taking it all in. Um, I really want to be mindful of your time as well. Uh, so I don't want to take up too much time. I think I want to end, uh, relatively soon but another question i definitely had was why what about kids on bikes over D D 5e was better to tell this particular story uh that's a great question first of all i love kids on bikes i love it so much kids on brooms the first time i uh, which is the expansion I played for the first time in misfits and magic with abria playing unbelievable um we love evan kel <laughs> oh, sweet evan oh my god um the the interesting thing about um about kids on bikes for this one is we are so lucky and fortunate to work with rick perry and his amazing you know raven bartlett and casey mcgeorge and these incredible artists and creators and collaborators and there are a lot of games where high fantasy if you're playing it requires these big set piece combats it's the battle of pelinor fields it's the you know it's like these you want these big rich combats in noir, combats are quick and dirty and violent, right? And there's this idea, I think, within the genre of it, of especially also like looking at the, our calendar year, like when we were doing this, we were also shooting Dungeons and Drag Queens, like right around the same time. So incredible, was, incredible season. Thank you so much. And so Rick was busy. And there's, I think there was a lot of reasons of like, noir doesn't really make sense for big, set piece battles as soon as you know you're not doing a big set piece battle you have to ask yourself if you should be playing 5e right like uh uh like if, if there's not a tactical combat board do you need a tactical combat system and no shade to people that do theater of the mind and like i have a podcast where i do theater of the mind 5e but for dimension 20 i think as soon as you get rid of those battle boards you go oh this genre probably wants these questions to be answered a little bit more quick and dirty and I think Kids on Bikes is great. The mechanic in Kids on Bikes, where you have your die total and succeed on rolls, I wish I could port that into every other TP TTRPG I play. It's so brilliant mm -hmm. to, to allow players, because I think that you get into problems when a GM dismisses a challenge. When a GM presents a challenge and says here's a challenge it's trivial it's gone <laughs> there's this weird moment where as players you're like oh okay thanks for letting us know that there might have been a problem but wasn't and <laughs> it's so much slicker and cooler uh, uh or even even as a gm if you try look at the gm you, you have a player who's playing like a warrior and you're like um you see a bunch of guards they draw swords but you're so good at fighting you beat them all they're beaten you did it we know that that doesn't feel good we know it it's so feel satisfying good. i feel it's, i don't know what you're talking yeah, about, what you're talking about. <laughs> it, we, but i understand why people would go hey i want some combats that don't take two hours of game time to, re to resolve through rolling initiative 
So I think it's really slick to allow players to dismiss a challenge mm. where, the, where, the, where the GM goes, here's a fight. It's a difficulty of six. And you're sitting here on a D12 fight skill and you go, oh, I succeed. Like that feels really good for the player to have that ability to say, yes, this was a real challenge and I'm so good that I can dismiss it as trivial, right? That's a difference. That makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, also, if you haven't listened to it, Worlds Beyond Number, fucking incredible. You oh! should just go, go listen to it. Bro, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Of course. I have so many other questions about the anti-capitalist stuff in that <laughs> campaign, but that's a whole other interview. Um, <laughs> I, I guess uh, to round this out, I kind of want to ask what you think people should expect of the latter half of the season. Uh, what people, I guess, what is your, your thesis statement for this as a piece of art? Um, there are choices made by the players in the last couple episodes of this story that are so beautiful and so meaningful that uh, it just reminds you of, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I have my little philosophy degree. I'll jump on a soapbox as often as people let me. Um, the meaningfulness of the later portions of the players' contributions to this are why we do TTRPG and why we do collaborative storytelling. You know, I'll, I'll grind my axe as many times as you let me, Rowan. Keep your eyes on these fucking players because they knocked me on my ass. They're just so incredible. Ugh, that makes me so incredibly happy to hear. Um, I'm sure this will not be the last time that we speak. This has been truly so lovely. Oh, a, a joy, a pleasure, and an honor, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll talk soon. Have a great one. Woo-hoo! Where's the end? <laughs> ah!